Hello everyone, welcome back to my channel. My name is Adija. Thank you so much for joining me again today. Today I have a special guest. Her name is Dr. Joycelyn Warmly and she will be talking to us today about the field of child and family social work. I'm very excited to have her here today. She has a wealth of experience in this field. Hello everyone. Like I said, we have a very special guest today. Her name again is Dr. Joycelyn Warmly. She is a child and family specialist in the state of California. And I'm so excited to learn more about this field because I have never worked in the child and family field. So I'm excited. I'll be learning just as much as everyone else is uh, learning today as they're watching us have a conversation about this special uh, social work field. Welcome Dr. Joycelyn Warmly. Thank you for having me. Thank you. We're so happy for you to be here. There's been a lot of conversation about social work with the um, videos that I've been doing about social work. A lot of students yes. are engaging. And one person recently was like, are you ever going to talk about child and family? I was like, I got you. It's coming. It's coming. Yes. So <laughs> we have Dr. Warmly here today. So again, welcome. So my first question for you is, what is your education background? How did you become a child and family specialist, a child and family social worker? Yes, yeah, so I started out in uh, at UC Merced. I got my Bachelor's of Arts in Psychology. And during my undergraduate experience, I became immersed in the field of psychology. I worked in the child development lab and worked right aside a um, PhD researcher. And uh, she was doing uh, research on children. And it was very specific, mm -hmm. but it had to do with children and how they understood language. And so once I you know, really focused on psychology, after graduating, I was kind of torn between going into uh, something where I was helping children uh, as a counselor mm -hmm. or helping children as a teacher. Okay. So okay. after um, getting my bachelor's in psychology, I decided to get my master's in social work. Um, there was a lot of growing and work experience uh, where I worked in group homes and different things. But um, I got my master's in social work next, and that was in 2014, so just a few years of gap. And once mm -hmm. I got my master's in social work, um, it's very important to note that I was in the Title IV-E cohort. And okay. for anyone, what, is, what is Title IV-E? That's a good question. So anyone who's interested in working with children and families uh, has the opportunity to get their education, uh, their master's education paid for by the Title IV-E um, it's like a law that says a we program. need to read a program that we need to use to retain social workers. So you get a stipend, a monetized stipend. Uh, at the time when I was in the MSW program, our stipend was um, $1,850 per month. Okay. So $1,850. And it was for me, it was like a paycheck, right? Um, I did not have to work during my MSW program because um, I had really? $18.50 per month. I did not work until, I want to say, um, my second, like, I worked because I wanted to, but I really didn't have to. To work, because you had a stipend in addition to the education, uh, they covered your education as well, your master's. Uh, I, I, I got zero student loans in my MSW program, mm. because uh, the stipend covered my education cost, and then it gave me pocket money. And okay. so at the time, uh, I had a roommate, uh, and we split the cost. And my 1850 covered my car payment, my electricity bill. Um, I was able to get assistance with food. So I lived very modestly for two years, right? Okay. But here's the drawback: after two years, and they had have given you 1850 a month for two years, right? The drawback was you were contracted and required to work for child welfare after you graduated with your okay. MSW. So it wasn't that you got this MSW for free and now you got to do whatever you wanted to do with it. It was you got um, your MSW Title IV-E and you got specialized classes that were directly related to child welfare. Your internship was at CPS and it was expected after two years you worked for CPS. Okay. And it was funny because when I started uh, 
the application process and the interviewing process to get in the Title IV program, I thought child welfare meant anything related to child welfare. The welfare of children is more than child protective services. Mm -hmm. However, the contract is with child protective services. Okay. So after graduating, I did my two years. My contract was, you know, um, done and settled. I didn't have to continue to work for them, but I still do. That's where I currently work. I work in child welfare. Okay. The okay. way child welfare is, there is a lot of, how do I say this, um, laws and policies that I don't necessarily agree with that directly impact the well-being of families. Mm -hmm. And that is okay. what encouraged me to get my doctorate. I, I'm not a yes sayer. I'm a person who pushes the envelope and mm -hmm. asks the really difficult questions, those really difficult why questions, and it usually circled back to policy and practice. And so that encouraged me to get my doctorate in social work at the University of Southern California, where I created an innovative uh, child welfare approach to reporting child abuse. Um, and it's my hope that we reduce the number of children who are entering the system, because once they do enter the system, they leave uh, the child welfare system worse off than, what, than, than the way that they entered. Mm. And that conversation <laughs> okay. can, okay. can go on for a long time because um, the welfare of children is, it's funny because that's the purpose of child welfare, right? We wanna protect the welfare of children, where in mm. fact, due to the, the placement changes, parent-child separation, uh, child abuse, the reason why they got in the system, right. some continuing right. child abuse by parents who foster parents, right, that are contracted to protect children sometimes have situations. There's a lot of different extenuating and complicated circumstances that lead children to uh, being behaviorally and developmentally um, disrupted. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's, so, it's, it's so really tough. So I'm hearing you say that, you know, the child and family uh, field is a very complex system, right? Very, like, I, I'm hearing very you say complex. that. Um, and thank you so much for the um, insight that you provided regard, regarding a Title four e Is that what you said? That it's is kind of something fun. that I've never heard of before. So it's a, it's a great uh, information for social workers, young social workers out there that are looking to get into the field. Um, they're worried about student loans. That's a great way. You know, that's a great information for them to know that your MSW can be covered given that you know you can do that for two years in exchange for years of service in that in, in the child Absolutely. family field. Yeah Absolutely. so that, that's really great because a lot of people get stressed out. I was on a <laughs> last week and a lot of students were getting stressed out about student loans but if you know what field that you're going into you can see what resources are out there for school coverage education absolutely coverage. and yeah. i will say the one drawback is if child if cps uh child protective services is not the right field for you and you don't satisfy the two years you do have to know you have to pay it back mm -hmm. so the the contract is to encourage you to stick it through no one okay. wants to pay back X amount of dollars, right? No. To anyone, <laughs> whether it be the government, like a friend, girl, you loan me the money, I'm keeping it. Right. But it's like an investment. So right. I do have some friends who chose not to continue in the child welfare path. And I do have some people who said, oh my gosh, I'm so glad I'm still here. Like this is where I'm meant to be. It depends on the person. But once you have your MSW, it's yours. Right, and right. it doesn't mean it's yours only if you work for child welfare. I can work as a social worker anywhere mm -hmm. with my MSW. And my experience in child welfare um, is very complex and it's not just specified to children. You know, in child welfare, we, own, we work with families. We work very closely with people who are in the mental health agency. Mm -hmm. I'm always working with uh, different schools and the systems that serve children who are developmentally delayed. So it is a very complex system and you can get a variety of experience and how you, I don't know, uh, pivot to another mm -hmm. field is another conversation, but it can happen. And a lot of people yeah. do do it. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So I want us to get into your uh, personal, your inspiration behind why you decided to be a child and family social worker. Okay, so first and foremost, I love children. Um, I have two children, they're four and six, my babies. But uh, even as a little person, um, I grew up in a very 
you know, complex childhood. Um, and not to put my parents' business out there, but they were young, 16 mm -hmm. and 17, having kids. They had no business having kids that young. Mm -hmm. And so I grew up in a very complex situation and it just led me to really empathize with other children. Once I grew up and I was able to understand my childhood more, I empathized more with children who were in those situations. And I find myself as a social worker always educating parents from the perspective of the child. Mm -hmm. Because I, although, I am well into my adult years in the inside. I remember so clearly what it feels like to be a child in certain situations. Um, and I can say, your child is not saying this, but this is what's going on for your child. To be an advocate for children, educate parents. These are some of the very important key factors that social workers must do is to advocate and educate Absolutely. people. And so uh, because of my personal history, it's, it's literally like God, like, led me to be a social worker because of my upbringing. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And as I became an adult and I worked as a counselor in residential care, I worked as a mentor and tutor for an after school program. I worked as a TA. I have always centered my life around children mm -hmm. and the well-being of children. I'm the person who talks to someone in a grocery store about the best way to talk to your children, you know, and sometimes I have to say, Joycelyn, mind your business. But when I see <laughs> children, um, I sometimes take it upon myself to advocate, educate, empower, you know, children. Right, right. Um, so the easy answer is it's, it's just in me. It's in me. And so um, I'm always thinking about, well, what's my next step? And children are always, ch children and families are always usually a part of that question to myself. Okay. Okay. Thank you so much for sharing your personal story behind that. Um, my next question for you is with uh, being a child and family specialist, what, what exactly is it that you do? Because social workers, I'm going to keep it real, Dr. Warmly, child and family social workers, they have a bad rap and you know it. They have a bad rap that they come and take the kids away. And when, you know, I want you to provide the information and clarity. What exactly do y'all do? What do you do? <laughs> I'm not going to lie. Okay. <laughs> we do a lot. Okay. <laughs> so I did work in child um, and as an emergency response investigator. So this is the cliche, don't take my kids away mm -hmm. type role. Mm -hmm. In that role as a child welfare investigator, right? Uh, this is this department is called emergency response and okay. you respond to immediate child welfare crises right imagine if someone makes a call to cps and they say so and so has bruises right johnny's uh johnny's dad or susie's dad just whipped him with the belt and this child has bruises on their body this emergency response social worker is responsible for immediately going out to that home and addressing that situation. So you're looking at the child. Number one, you got to talk to the child in a safe place. So safety is a very important topic, like when to go to the home, do you go with law enforcement? Do you just go with yourself? Um, are you calling before you go? Are you just popping up? Okay. Uh, are you talking to the child at school? With schools closed, how does that work? Not sure. Do, right. are, you, are you talking to children when they're first safe um, or do you not go out at all because the police need to handle it before you respond? All of these questions are going through your mind when you're assessing what is the best way to intervene. Child welfare investigations have a lot to do with intervention. Okay. Intervention and safe intervention and stabilizing the situation. Usually the best way to stabilize it is to remove the threat that causes the safety concern. Okay. So sometimes if it's a parent who is you know, using excessive force um, and causing the child to have injuries and bruises, we say we need to get the child to a safe place. This is where you get the reputation of, well, we've taken kids out of the home. We have to remove the most vulnerable child, usually mm -hmm. the kids zero to five. These are vulnerable kids because they don't speak up for themselves. Mm -hmm. We have to remove the safety threat and also get vulnerable kids out of that situation. And sometimes it's handled in many ways. The police arrest the perp. That's one way. Okay. He's out, he's out so I hear you say this. Well, the first thing I hear you say is, I heard you say rather, is that first of all, child and family social workers provide emergency response. 
children yes. are considered to be population at risk. Therefore, if there's any threat to their safety, you respond to make sure that they're possibly, they can be removed from that situation and placed mm -hmm. in a safer environment, or you can work on other things, other arrangements as well. Absolutely. All right, we have to get our lighting situation together. <laughs> it is okay. <laughs> so Dr. Warmly, so you talked about the child and family social workers that do the uh, emergency response. Yes. I have also heard of child and family social workers that do reunification of the children with their parents or whoever their guardians are. So can you please talk a little bit more about that? So family reunification, uh, these are child welfare social workers who work with the court and the parents to rejoin the family unit. And so if a child is removed from their home and they're under the jurisdiction of the court, it means that the child was removed due to welfare and institution codes that uh, stated the child was abused and neglected. And the court is required to make a dispositional hearing, a jurisdiction, the dispositional hearing, we call it a juris dispo, okay. which states what does the parent need to do to get the child back? That is a case plan. And that is literally a contract between the parent and the court in order for the parent and uh, for the family to reunify. Okay. And so we are very court driven that if the child is reunifying with the parent, it is based on well, what the court believes needs to happen. And a family reunification worker will make sure the parents are following their case plan. Simple as that. Sometimes okay. those case plans are, in my opinion, unreasonable. And the family reunification social worker needs to be able to advocate for that parent and say, you're asking him to get from downtown to midtown in 30 minutes. It's impossible. And so they're, they're advocating for their parents, right? They will also probably educate uh, maybe the parent or the children say, hey, doing your visits, because they will have visits maybe weekly or monthly, and say, doing your visits, it's important that you are uh, being attentive to your child when they are crying and you don't dismiss it, or that you're helping them with their homework and you're not just playing games with them. Mm -hmm. It's important that you engage in normal parental activities and not just the luxury weekend type of parenting. Right. Okay. So family unification workers, they really work um, very closely with the parent, the court and the child um, as like a liaison, a person who is just getting it all together to ensure that the family unit can be put back together. They're also continuing to assess safety issues. Do okay. the issues that currently that led to the child's removal, do they still exist? A very common one is domestic violence. Right. So a parent and a, and a spouse are fighting in the in the children, the children get hurt in the middle of the fight, the children get removed. The parent has a case plan and has agreed to discontinue that relationship. Yet, the family reunification worker pops up for an unannounced visit and guess who's there? Either same old person or same type of person. person. Okay. Same type of person and that one, I have to really get my head around like, it's not the same, Tom is not the, is not the same as Benjamin. But if Benjamin and Tom have the same characteristics, then we didn't see a behavioral change. So another thing that they do is they assess for behavioral changes. How do we know the children won't be hurt again? We have to assess the risk. The risk is a future maltreatment. We assess what is the likelihood that the child will be maltreated again. In order to reunify, that risk needs to be low, right? So we have a lot of different instruments and tools that help us to determine what is the risk level, what is the safety level, what is the danger, what is the harm. There are a lot of different practices and tools that child welfare social workers become very familiar with and there's a science behind them. So when we do a court report, because you have to report to the court what the mm -hmm. update is, you have to discuss the, the risk, the harm, and all of these different things. So the FR worker really has a really important job because they have to uh, join the family back together and attest to the future safety due to evidence of behavioral changes. So this is why most FR uh, workers have master's degrees um, and the very minimum a bachelor's degree. Okay, so uh, someone with a bachelor's of a social work degree can work as a child yes. and family social worker. Okay, they That's can and actually they do very okay. frequently. And okay. it's, in my opinion, it's unfair because they get the same work. 
if you're a bachelor's level social worker, you don't get easier cases. You don't get cases that are less complex. You get the same level, you just get less pay. Mm. Now this is in California. I'm a master's, I'm an MSW first, now I'm a DSW. Mm -hmm. But when I talk to my colleagues who are bachelors and I ask them, I say, oh, is your caseload smaller than mine? Maybe, you know, no. Caseload is the same. Uh, okay. Um, and okay. it's tough because it's like, why work here if you are going to, as a bachelor's level, if you get the same load, the same complexities, and not the same pay, you know, we get a policy issue there. The reason why they want you to have a master's degree is because your ability to analyze mm -hmm. these, com com these complicating factors become. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't want to say easier, but it just becomes part of your normal speech, right? That once you get a master's degree, it means that you have mastered um, the ability to discover and analyze information. Right, right. As a right. bachelor's, it means, well, I don't have my bachelor's in social work, but it usually means that you understand generalist practice. Mm -hmm. um, I do teach social work. So I understand what they're learning in social work and at the bachelor's level because I'm teaching level. it now as a professor. But um, for me, my bachelor's is in psychology. And I think having a master's degree really allowed me to understand the job better. Okay. Because for two years in my master's program, I wasn't just getting general social work education. My education in my master's degree directly related to child welfare. Okay. I was taking extra classes in child welfare. My internship was in child welfare. So when I came out of that two years later, my ability to analyze information, identify complex issues, uh, my ability to understand the law, I'm not an attorney, but my ability to understand surface level law related right, issues. Right, right. So I, I heard you say a couple of things there. So for uh, bachelor level social workers that are working in the child and family field, it is in their best interest to pursue a master's degree, take yeah, advantage yeah. of that Title IV-E program that you talked about earlier, so yeah. you can make the most out of it. So if you're, if you're going to be in this field anyways, why not make the most as why far not? as income-wise? And they pay for it, so why yes. not? Yes. You know? yes. I will say that those programs are very um, hard to get into. Like there is a lot of people who are already working as bachelor's level social workers who apply for the MSW program with social work experience under their belt already, you know? Mm -hmm. And they're like, because they wanna get their MSW. Um, it's, 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 it's like, a, what is it called when it's just, it's competitive, that's the mm -hmm. word. Right. It's competitive. Right. And I remember when I did my application, cause I didn't have any problems getting in. I did have people who say they applied twice, three times, four times. I applied one time, and here's what I'll tell you if you're listening. They look at how many hours have you already devoted to children and families. Okay. If you think about my history, I said I've been working with children since I was in the bachelor's level social work. And after graduating with my bachelor's in uh, psychology, I didn't, my bachelor's not in social work. When I graduated with my bachelor's in psychology, yeah, I got gotcha. working with children. All right. of those hours added up, right? They asked me for, I want to say for the last, uh, I think they asked the last six months or the last year, how many hours have you worked with children and families? At that time, I had two full-time jobs. I was a crazy person. I was working, <laughs> my for, right now. I was working for one <laughs> group home during the day and mm -hmm. I did overnights at night for wow. another group. Home. That was intense. It was intense. And it's, I, I have been the tendency to like put stuff on my plate to keep me busy. Mm -hmm. uh, a very personal insight at that time, my grandfather passed away okay. and it was really, really hard to be at home. Okay. It was hard to be home and he passed away. He didn't pass away in our home, but our home was the last place. I was still living in my family unit, my, my mom and siblings. It was hard to go back and his his room was empty. You know, it was hard. Okay. So okay. I buried myself so a personal in personal reason for doing that. Yeah. And it, it, it worked out because at the end, when they asked me, well, how many hours have you contributed to blah, blah, blah? I said, well, like, here you go. <laughs> I worked 24 hours a day for six months. And they even asked me for references. I say, look, this is, this is crazy. How did you do that? And I had references. I had my bosses and colleagues who can attest to my work schedule. And I got in, you know, okay. um, okay. 
That's 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 definitely good to know. So let's go back a little bit. So when we're talking about the different types of uh, duties child and family social workers have, or maybe the setting rather, uh, we talked about the emergency response social worker. We talked about the social worker that does the family family reunification. Are there other types of um, child and family social workers, and what yeah. settings do they work? So right now I'm in adoption. You can give us so. like two more. Mm-hmm. So um, I'm an adoption, so adoption social worker is one. Okay. And the one right before adoptions, it would be um, maybe they have all different, like there's like informal supervision. So okay. Um, okay. I'll talk about adoptions. So ad adoptions, people like to glorify adoptions. Like, oh my God, once you get to adoptions, like you've hit the jackpot. It's a beautiful part of the system. You get to make families whole again. The child gets a permanent placement. The CPS case closed. You get to have children exit foster care. It's rainbows and sunshine, okay? <laughs> I'll talk about the rainbows and sunshine first. All of those things are true. Getting children out of foster care is an amazing feeling. It's a tear-jerking type of moment mm -hmm. when you have a child who has bounced home to home to home, and finally, they feel loved. And finally, that person who loves them has committed to them. Mm -hmm. And when a child has that commitment, their ability to thrive and grow is exponential. Like mm -hmm. I have seen 180s when children first get <clears throat> placed with someone and they commit to them, then it's just like, wow, like this child is blossoming. Mm -hmm. And as the social worker, your note taking changes. You're not talking about all these safety concerns anymore. You're not talking about domestic violence anymore. You're talking about the child's now meeting milestone. The child's now talking. The child is now uh, mirroring more what we expect. And I have one child and I can't say this child's name, but this particular child, um, I witnessed when his placement was disrupted, a foster parent said he, they couldn't take care of him. They had to place him somewhere else. I found this new home. He was, five and i'm struggling with saying five because he was more like three or two but he was really five Deve developmentally it was like yeah developmentally he was okay. three or two. he okay. wasn't really talking he staggered when he walked and eh, it just like gosh is this child really five i had to go back to his birth certificate and do the math mm -hmm. because i didn't believe he was really five but in a matter of one year this child grew three inches so he shot up in his physical he also speaks fluent like normal speech where he can he can converse with me and talk oh, about man. what he likes uh his ability to understand is also just off the charts i mean this child blossomed mm -hmm. so this parent is going to adopt and i was able to write a report that spoke to his growth i mean that as a social i was just like smiling right yes, yes. beautiful and so when the adoption finalizes like i don't think there'll be a dry eye in the room or on the screen you know right. it's <laughs> right, a very, right. very 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 big day wow. here's wow. the flip side i just gave you a lot of rainbows and sunshine right right i'm like yes yes <laughs> yeah right and and people get drawn to adoptions because it's like yes i want to be a part of that okay right right here is the caveat when there is permanency right Permanency means a placement that is permanent. That mm -hmm. child gets a new birth certificate, right? That child is permanently a part of a new family. What no one talks about is the permanent removal from a family. This child is permanently removed from a birth parent. Mm -hmm. I have to terminate parental rights and in a system, I have to document that, that this parent's a uh, parental role has ended. You literally have to put an end date. I remember the first time I did that, I said, what? Like, <laughs> I have to end right. the relationship? That's part of the difficulty of that job. Mm. Technically, they're not the mom anymore. Technically, the mom is the foster parent who is now the parent. Technically, that's that child's parent. Technically, that child's identity has changed. He has a new birth certificate. The old person kind of just- Wait, hold on, Dr. Warmly. A new birth certificate? Yes, meaning think about this, adoption. Adopted children I didn't know that. are mirrored as your natural children. I use the word natural to right. mirror 
other words, but natural child. Biological. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you're not the child's biological parent, but you're, it, it mirrors your natural parents. It's your natural child. It's the same thing, right? Okay. And in order to, to show that legally, there's a new birth certificate because the other parent is not the parent, right? You're the parent. So mm-hmm. I've had some same-sex couples and they'll say parent one, parent two. Other couples will say mother and father, if that's what they want. But you're the parent. The child gets a new last name because they're with the new family. Okay. I, I, I never, yeah, I, I didn't know. Here's why this is really, really, really hard. This is really hard. And I've struggled with this since day one. I've almost just sometimes just quit because of this particular thing. When you remove the child from a family, right? The birth parent is the parent that maybe contributed to the abuse and neglect, right? The birth parent made some really bad choices. Some right. choices that uh, caused a lot of abuse and neglect. The grandparents, the siblings, the aunts, the uncles, the cousins, they all mm-hmm. suffer those same consequences. Mm-hmm. They all suffer the same consequences. That's true. And That's true. The department That's true. has to diligently notice those relatives and give them the opportunity to get placement. And sometimes they can't. It has nothing to do with love. I don't want people to hear this and say, come on now, they love that child just as their own. Give them those kids, give them. The law is so complex that if you don't meet certain standards, you cannot have these children in your home, period. And this is why I struggle to even stay in the field because I don't always agree with the law, the policies. I don't. And that's the hard part that no one talks about when a grandmother wants to know, well, why can't I see my grandchild? The aunt wants to know, why can't I see my nephew? The sibling wants to know, why can't I see my sibling? And you have to articulate according to bloop, 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 and it becomes very unpersonal. It becomes very just factual. It becomes very, I just need you to get your attorney to respond to my attorney and let them handle it. And then I can get the direction and I'll do that. Okay. I, I really appreciate your transparency with how, how difficult the job can be sometimes, especially, okay, yes, we're placing a child in a safer environment, but there's also a termination of parents or parental rights and family rights, really. Right. On yeah. the other end too. So I, I, I appreciate you being transparent about that because that is the reality of the job, you know, and sometimes as social workers, we have to do things that is in the best interest of our client and not necessarily how we feel about a situation. And I think it's important for future social workers that want to get into this field to know that these are things that you're going to encounter. We've talked about the different types of child and family social workers, the emergency response, the reunification, the adoption. There are different things about each of those roles that you might not be comfortable with, but you have to always remember to keep the best interest of your client at heart. And that's what I hear you say, that sometimes you do struggle with it as well. But at the end of the day, it's all about that child. Absolutely. And I will say that in family reunification, you're you're really focused on the parent. Like that's your client, that parent following the case plan. That is your focus. When you get to adoptions, your focus is the child, right? Your focus on the child's permanency, what's in the best interest of the child. Mm-hmm. While the child is always important in every aspect of CPS, sometimes it's, it's, it's important that we devote our attention to the parents so they can get their child back. Mm-hmm. You can't place a child in a home and that, that, that home was never fixed. If, if the safety issues right. were never right. mitigated, if the family didn't make behavioral changes in how they discipline and, and speak and how they navigate their life, if they don't make those changes, that child, no matter how much time and love you devote to the child in foster care, will go back to an unsafe home. Right, and exactly. it's, it's our responsibility as a social worker to make sure that all of these things are addressed when we are working in various fields um, if I can touch on one more role is the hotline yes. social worker. You said what? hotline, hotline, like the intake oh. worker. Okay. So the intake worker, um, in my opinion, it's not the easiest job, but it sounds like it. They're the ones who are on the phone when someone makes a call and then say, Hey, little girl, Sally is outside playing in the streets and her family is okay. not opening the door and she's left unsupervised. We need someone to check on this family. The hotline social worker takes that call, 
they have to ask really hard and difficult questions. They have to sometimes be the one to get law enforcement out there first. You know, policies don't respond to child safety. Policies do not. If the policy is uh, that child, if over the age of woo, 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 no, that doesn't save kids. What save children is immediate intervention. Right. And so that intake social worker sometimes has to do whatever they need to do to get immediate intervention, even if that means getting law enforcement out there immediately, because they are sometimes mm -hmm. our first responders before we respond. Okay, so that's and a different so, type of social worker. Okay. Yeah. And so social okay. workers, they also have to ask questions about, um, I don't know, who, who is this family? Has this family been in contact with us before? They'll go and do a quick history search and mm -hmm. see, okay, what do we know about them? They do a lot of computer work. They're not actually in the field, driving a county car, doing that kind of work, but they're behind the computer assessing. And I will say, because I worked in a county that was very small, the intake social worker did everything. We did vertical case management. Vertical case manage management is when you do the first part of the system and carry it through. So you take the call. If okay. Sally's in the middle of the street because the parents are in the house, maybe they're, I don't know, sleep or on drugs, I don't know. Then you hang up the phone, you call law enforcement and you drive the county car to the home. If you remove that child, you also do the reunification part, right? You also work oh, with that. Family. You play all of those different roles. Okay. Yes. I did that oh, for six months. I could not do it. That sounds like a lot. <laughs> because like a lot. I always, I felt I was always doing something new. Mm -hmm. I never got good at anything. I did everything once, right? Because you're not doing just one job. You're doing a ton of jobs, mm -hmm. you know? So I never got good at court report writing because sometimes I was on the phone doing intake calls. I never got really good at intake calls because sometimes I was doing visits. I never got really good at visits because sometimes I was doing other things and it was like, I did everything a little bit, right? Mm -hmm. In the county that I work in, I do one thing. So I get good at that one thing, you know? It's really good to specialize in something because you feel good about it, you do it better. You can be more critical of the things that come your way versus, I don't know, I'm doing it for the first time, so I'm doing what you told me to do. So vertical case management does happen in smaller counties. Okay. I, I don't prefer it, but there were people who had been in that county for decades and they were used to it and they liked it. Um, it wasn't for me. And so I will well, say- Well, that's good to know though, because some people might be thinking, well, it, it will look different based on the organization that you're working for. So it's important to yeah. be prepared for that as well. Yeah. I will say the benefit of that, because I did it for six months, I can say I work in every area in child welfare. Yeah, you <laughs> <It's> have. <true. laughs> yeah, you have. I, I literally did an interview and she was like, so what, what units have you worked in? I said, well, I've done the whole thing. Mm -hmm. And because now I've done adoptions, I've even done that. Mm -hmm. I can say I've done every part of the system. And that's why I can speak so intellectually about it, because I understand the nooks and uh, the like the nuts and bolts of the system after doing mm -hmm. vertical case management, but then also by doing uh, ER and adoptions just sp as a specialized scope, you know, right. when you specialize in something, you become more critical and more analytical about it. So um, there's definitely a lot of moving around that you can do though. Mm -hmm. You don't have to just do one thing. That's, that's really awesome. I'm, and I want to Thank you for being transparent about the difficulties of the job, because I think that it's important for people to understand the whole spectrum, like just the whole picture rather. Um, I want to ask you too, what are some advice that you have for future social workers that are looking to get into the field of child and family services? First, um, I recommend that you are very sure of um, yourself. Okay, if, if you are going into this field, know yourself, know, know your triggers. Uh, I grew up in a very difficult, uh, with a very difficult childhood, and I was able to notice when I was triggered by certain language or certain smells or certain um, responses to children. And if you don't know that you're triggered by that, you're not going to be objective or um, you're not going to be able to work without being biased, you know? Your biases as a social worker sometimes directly affect the course of the case. Right. So my, and, and this is, I think that's social work in general. I don't think that's just child welfare. 
Right. I right. think for social workers in general, you need to know yourself, know your triggers, uh, know the things that make you love what you're doing. So my second thing is be passionate about something. If you're passionate about families, you're passionate about children, or you're passionate about keeping the family unit safe and together, together. find and identify that passion. Um, my passion is in the well-being of children. Whether it means their well-being is directly related to them unifying or their well-being means that they should not reunify. I'm so invested in that child's well-being that I'm able to do this job from the child's perspective and have a child-centered approach. Mm -hmm. And the child-centered approach is not always the parent-centered approach. I've told parents my recommendation and I said, I know it does not look like what you need it to look like, but your child doesn't need that right now. Mm -hmm. And here's why. And be okay with saying that. Mm -hmm. And sleep, you sleep good at night when you do what feels good to you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I would not feel good if I just did something because I don't want this mom to be sad. So I'm going to just, you know, but in my heart of heart, I'm like, ooh, that's not good. <laughs> so, right. so right. be passionate about something, children, families, or both. Um, and the last thing is self-care. Know how to take care of yourself. Um, literally just yesterday was Friday and I was at home and my husband said, um, hey, I, I, I thought you, you know, you had something to do. I said, I, I decided not to do it. My neck hurts. I know I hold stress in my neck. Mm -hmm. And I didn't know that until my doctorate program. I would literally be sitting on the camera like, why does my neck hurt? Like, what? And I, and I did a lot of just breathing and I realized I'm stressed. Right. And so just being able to just rest my neck and close my eyes, you know, uh, take a bath with some scented candles or something, do something so I can rest and I don't feel that tension. But even at work, if I start to feel myself tense here, I don't care what I'm doing. I stop doing it. Yeah. It's time and to I rest. take a walk. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, and I just, I don't know. I just stop for a while. Mm -hmm. uh, gospel music or talking to my sisters or mm -hmm. eating, unfortunately, uh, anything to just stop for a minute. Self-care is so, so, so important. Absolutely. Um, and even being mindful of what burnout feels like. Right. right. Um, and how to recover from burnout. So um, I recently decided to start a consulting business and where I'm gonna start doing some courses where I'm teaching aspiring social workers and other people who provide direct services to children and families like agencies. Mm -hmm. And one of my first courses are gonna be about burnout and burnout recovery because okay. social awesome. workers are so heavily burned out. I wanna say we're the number one in like the most stressful fields or whatever. <laughs> and yeah, that- Very stressful for sure. Yeah, and that when Social workers burn out, agencies have a hard time retaining them and recruiting them. And once you recruit workers, you got to train them. There's a lot of expenses. And so I'm hoping that we retain our social workers and put the focus back on self care and, you know, really focusing on our well being. You know, we're worried about children's well being. We got to worry about our own well being, you know? Right, right. Um, I have two children. And I, I told many people who I work with, I said, don't think I'm going to do this job and not take care of my children. I, I need to stop working so I can pick them up and they don't get called in the hotline because their mama left them at daycare. You know what I'm saying? I was like, I'm going to be up in the CPS system. So you got to have another thing, boundaries. Right. You got to have boundaries. It's okay to say no, you know? It is right. okay to say, I'm not the one who's going to do that. I had an attorney last week. Last week was hard. I had an attorney last week that said, can you get A and B, C done by, you know, Monday, like coming up Monday, like pretty right. soon. I said, no, I can't. I can't do that by Monday, but I'll put the referral in and I'm sure to get done by the end of February. We need this done by Monday. Unfortunately, Monday is not a reasonable timeline for me. If yeah, this so was, yeah. yeah, that's not a reasonable timeline for me. If the court takes issue with, our inability to meet that timeline, it's no fault of mine that this timeline is just not being relayed to me. Mm -hmm. Take responsibility for the delayed communication. It won't be done by Monday. And of course- uh, Boundaries is a big one, for sure, for sure. Yeah, and I didn't say it won't be done by Monday. I said, unfortunately, unfortunately. Uh, that timeline was unreasonable. 
Right. I mean, they're, they're, they're nice ways to package a no. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so with um, new social workers, the two things that I heard you say is that they first have to uh, know what specialty they want to focus on, even within the child and family yes. services, and also be passionate about it. I was going to ask you a question about self-care, but and you already went into it. I love <laughs> that because for social workers, that is something that, and I think for any helping prof profession, self-care has to be a lifestyle. It can't be Absolutely. something that is like at the bottom of your to-do list. It has to be right up there with going to the grocery to get food and putting gas. Yes, in. It, has to, it has to be like right up there so I appreciate you for talking about that uh, I also wanted to say, ask you if you have any last words for future students anything else that you'd like for us to know mm -hmm. about the field I, I will say what I want you to know if you're looking to go into child welfare social work first I want to say thank you yeah. thank you for being interested in such an important job and career yeah. there's yeah. many things that you can do child welfare social workers, uh, we are very uh, educated and motivated and passionate and we can do anything. So if you can do child welfare social work, you can do any type of social work because you're doing so much. And if you're trying to learn how to pivot your career or trying to learn how to do different things, uh, just know number one, that you can do it. Mm -hmm. You can mm -hmm. do it. So uh, thank you for being interested in child welfare social work. We we just need more people to do it. Um, and I'm excited for the new social workers who are gonna be joining the field. Yes. Dr. Warmly, please share with us how to stay connected with you or if there's any projects that you're working on that you would like for us to follow you and keep updated about it. Please, can you please talk about that? Yeah, so um, I am just now starting my consulting business, Warmly Consulting. And so if you want to learn more about that, I will be launching my website. I would love to stay in March of 2021, but I will keep you posted. Um, okay. If you would like, you can email me at drjoycelynwormley at gmail.com. I'll She'll be sure to put it below. right here. <laughs> <laughs> and um, once I start offering courses, you can be a part of uh, my first cohort cohort to learn more about what you can do to uh, stay in the field, stay refreshed, uh, stay well, and uh, stay inspired. You know, I'll yeah, be doing some yeah. courses to educate you all on the field and how to navigate uh, social work. So awesome. I'm, I'm looking forward to all those new endeavors. And like I said, I'm hoping to start my consulting uh, in March of 2021. Awesome. Congratulations on the upcoming business launch. Congratulations. Thank you so much, Dr. Warmly. One thing that I really appreciate about our conversation today is your transparency about how difficult the job can be. You know, a lot of times we hear about the glitz and the glamour of a job, but I appreciate <laughs> your, uh, you know, transparency about that, knowing that, yes, we, you are fulfilling a purpose in making sure the uh, well-being of children uh, is at the it's at the priority. However, there's some difficulties with the profession that comes along with doing that job. So I appreciate yes. you being honest Ooh. and transparent about that. And again, thank you so much for coming on board today to share with us your knowledge and experience. I appreciate you. Is there thank anything you. else that you'd like to say before we wrap up? I do, and I wish I would have said this in the middle. Okay. What this is, is it? I wish it would have been in the middle. If you want to work in child welfare, it's just very lucrative. It's you'll have a very comfortable life. You'll get paid well. That's what I want to say. You okay. will get paid well. And okay. especially if you work for an organization with a union, they will keep advocating for raises and raising the raises. So um, it is not only uh, fulfilling to do what you love, um, but it's rewarding to be able to live a comfortable life. So yeah, yeah. I am excited for all of you to enter into the field. And if you have questions, feel free to drop them in the comments below. Awesome. Yeah. Oh, okay. So she's going to be answering some questions in the comments, in the comment <laughs> section below. So be sure to drop your questions there or email her. At, yes. I'll be putting the email address right here. So again, thank you so much, Dr. Warmly. We appreciate you. Thank you. <music>so much Dr. Joyce and Warmly for sharing your wealth of knowledge and experience with us. I hope that you've been able to learn a thing or two. If you have, please be sure to comment below and engage with this content. 
Also, if you're watching this video and you're not subscribed to my channel, please be sure to click on the subscribe button. I look forward to creating more social content for you all, as well as some mental health and lifestyle content as well. Thank you all so much for watching this video. Thanks again to Dr. Joycelyn Warmly for being a part of the conversation today about child and family social work. I'll see you all next time on my next video. Thank you so much for watching. God bless you and take care. Bye.